Good evening. My name is Denisa Lazaresco, and I'm a student project supervisor at the Clark Forum for Contemporary Issues. On behalf of the Clark Forum, the Pennsylvania State University Dickinson School of Law, Betty R. and Dan Churchill, I would like to welcome you to tonight's program, Breathing the Fire, the fight to report and survive the war in Iraq. 210. That's the number of journalists and media assistants that have been killed on duty in Iraq since the beginning of the conflicts on March 20th, 2003. 14, the number of reporters currently kidnapped. Two, the number is still missing. And finally, 244, the percentage increase in the deaths of journalists over the past five years. Not since World War II has the world seen such a deadly conflict for the journalism community. The popularity of embedding reporters within fighting forces means that they are becoming their own breed of soldiers, assuming many of the same risks as the troops they're following. While embedded journalism has allowed reporters to get closer to understanding the complexities of war, press officers must perform their duty as watchdogs by conveying the news as accurately as possible and remain safe during the reporting from the front lines. Unfortunately, stringent security measures taken to protect embedded journalists have not guaranteed their safety. Murder, crossfire, combat, and kidnapping are just a few of the ways that they have become targets. These actions now beg the question if the war in Iraq has become a war on journalists. Kimberly Dozier is a CBS News correspondent and author of the forthcoming book, Breathing the Fire. Since 2003, she has covered stories in Iraq and the Middle East for the CBS Evening News, The Early Show, and CBS Radio News. In 2007, Ms. Dozier was awarded the American Women in Radio and Television Grand Gracie Award and the Association for Women in Communications 2007 Helen Duhamel Achievement Award. She also won a 2007 Peabody Award for her piece about two female veterans who lost limbs in Iraq on CBS News Sunday morning, The Way Home. Dozier graduated magna cum laude with a Bachelor in Arts in Human Rights and Spanish from Wesley College and holds a master's degree in foreign affairs from the University of Virginia. At this time, I would like to ask that you turn off all electronic devices. Also, please hold all questions until the question and answer session at the end of the program. Because this program is taped and some audience members may be hearing impaired, please wait until the microphone has been brought to you before beginning to speak. Since Ms. Dozier's book will not be released until May 13th, the publisher has sent us complimentary copies of the blad for the book, which are available to be signed by Ms. Dozier following the program in the lobby. And now, please join me in welcoming Kimberly Dozier. Thank you very much, and apologies that my publisher is being so strict about the book. I would have liked to have given you a preview, seen everyone's reaction. So. Some of you have heard a little bit of my story. You might remember it from a year and a half ago, but I'm going to review it for you now. No one wants to be the bearer of bad tidings, but that's what I was for three years from Iraq. And I got my share of criticism. Now, liberals have criticized me for being what one called a corporate cheerleader for the criminal war in Iraq. My own journalists criticize, uh, my own journalist colleagues criticize me for being um, too comfortable with the military and too willing to embed. Conservative websites attack me for being a hotel-bound anti-patriot, and I'm quoting, who criticized the war effort and failed to spend enough time with the troops. Then terrorists or insurgents, depending on how you want to label them, attacked my team as we followed a U.S. patrol on Memorial Day in 2006 in Baghdad. And since then, as I recuperated, and there was a wave of public opinion against the war in Iraq, I've seen my original reporting criticized again as not being harsh enough. And I've been blamed as one of the group of reporters who didn't stand up and shout out, um, as I should have. So I guess I've come full circle. From all that, I've learned a couple of things which um, apply to my business and probably to whatever endeavor some of you young students in the crowd are going to end up taking on. 
first of all, you don't do this job for the thank you. You do it because you know you're doing the right thing. And uh, you will always get criticized. But you can comfort yourself by saying, if you're offending all sides equally, you must be doing something right. And if you don't take the risks of telling the unpopular stories or taking the hard route, you're letting the critics win, and you will let people down, which means you've just got to get comfortable with risk. Sometimes that means uh, risk to the next promotion, and in extreme cases like mine, risk to your life. And lastly, on a personal note, that surviving the psychological slog of being a network television reporter in Baghdad is fantastic training for the year and a half it took to recover from a car bomb. Now, all of these lessons came the hard way, and you've seen some of it on the news. So uh, let me refresh your memory. A year and a half ago, CBS cameraman Paul Douglas, soundman James Brolin, and I joined a patrol of the 4th Infantry Division on Memorial Day. Our purpose was to show that the guys and gals in Baghdad were out on the street eating Baghdad dust while folks back home were shopping, enjoying barbecues, and doing all those things that have nothing to do with what Memorial Day is all about. We did not know that we would end up living their tragedy and sharing their sacrifice. For our first stop, Captain Funkhauser wanted to visit a spot where the day before a roadside bomb had hit an Iraqi patrol. This was all part of the they stand up, we stand down idea of turning things over to Iraqi forces. Now, what generally happened when the Iraqis were hit, they were scared to go back into an area. So the idea was there would be this joint American-Iraqi patrol, they would go back together, they would talk to the people on the street, they would try to figure out how in this safe neighborhood, so safe it was about to be handed over to full Iraqi patrol, an insurgent had moved into that street and planted a roadside bomb. What we figured out happened was this had been intended to be a complex attack. That means two-pronged. The roadside bomb had hit the Iraqi patrol. It had injured a couple of the soldiers. The Iraqis had taken their wounded, thrown them into the vehicle, and driven off to the green zone a mile and a half away to help. The second explosion, which would have been meant to catch the rescuers and the gawkers that came into the scene, well, it was left with nothing to hit until 24 hours later when we drove down that street, parked our cars, and got out to talk to Iraqis. Now, what Captain Funkhauser was telling me, and this is way before um, we in the media were saying, yes, the American military is doing hearts and minds outreach. We'd actually been saying it since 2003. But um, it just became more in vogue to say it over the last year. Captain Funkhauser knew the people on that street, or some of them. He said, I want to look into their eyes. They know someone's moved in. They can tell me where they are. They can tell me where the strangers are. So we're walking past the Humvees on one side and a bunch of villas on the other side. He said, see that bombed out villa next to us? No. Try to look without looking. Yeah, I see it. The insurgent cell we think is in there. They could be watching us right now. With that, he saw his translator about 10 feet ahead of us, had already reached the Iraqis at the tea stand. He jackrabbited ahead of me. And in that instant, I remember trying to catch up, but thinking, I'll hang back, let my crew, I could see them over here, let them get the shot, then I'll step in. And in that instant, the world went black. Someone was watching, uh, an insurgent command detonated a 500-pound car bomb, which we were walking towards. We were all within 20 to 30 feet of it, the entire 12-person patrol, except for a couple of the guys that were in one of the Humvees parked further up. So almost everyone was hit. Now, as you might have heard last year, two of the soldiers and I were left fighting for our lives. And it took almost an hour to get us to the green zone. I lost more than half my blood. I thought my heart stopped twice. I just ran into some of the doctors who actually did the chest compressions on me for two hours. One of them complained. He said, do you know how hard it is to do those things? He said, you didn't code twice. You coded five times. You just kept dying. 
what do you say? Like, thank you five times? I don't know. So um, I'm very lucky to be here. But people think that we made a lot about that attack because we were there. We had a lot of criticism of how we reported that. And I tell people there was nothing special about that attack. There were five car bombs in Baghdad that day. But the fact that reporters were hit, it accomplished two things. We lived through what American soldiers had been going through. But we also became part of a disturbing pattern. An Army press officer explained to me later, months later after I'd gotten out of the hospital, that they'd noticed a pattern. If a camera crew came to a neighborhood and the insurgents saw it, they planned an attack that either attacked the crew or they attacked near the crew to make sure it had gotten reported. We had noticed the same thing, that uh, a couple times we went to Dura. You hear about Sadr City? Ain't got nothing on Dura, which is a, an interface neighborhood, or it used to be, between Sunnis and Shias. And each time we reported there, 24 hours later, a car bomb went off um, on the spot where we'd walked or driven. In short, we used to stand next to the targets, and now we are the targets. And that's had a chilling effect on how much news we can bring you. Now, the first reason is simple. You get bigger and better headlines if you hit a journalist or near one. If we witness it or catch it on tape, the violent act doesn't just terrorize that particular local neighborhood. We get the word out to everyone. In a sense, we do the adversary's job for them. But the second reason is they hit us because now journalists are seen as partisan. We're no longer the impartial Red Cross-like observers who crossed enemy lines in places like Kosovo, where in the morning I could uh, visit a Serbian military outpost. In the afternoon, I could hang out with the KLA, and then I could be back in Pristina in time for dinner and a nice cappuccino. Many of my colleagues blame embedding with the US military. Now, personally, I think it started earlier. I think it started in Afghanistan, way before the practice of embedding became commonplace, at least for my generation of journalists. The Taliban targeted us because we were foreign, symbols by virtue of our nationality, of the invader. Just after the fall of Kabul, my ex-Taliban driver saved my life, and probably his, by speeding through a rogue Taliban checkpoint that had been set up uh, between Jalalabad and Kabul. It's a nice, rocky four-hour drive. Now, by the time the um, black turban guys spotted me in a veil in the back seat of this rundown taxi that we'd hired, we had come level with them. My guide spoke to the driver. They floored it. We were around the corner before the AKs were up to fire. We got away with it. An hour later, the journalist convoy behind me uh, the convoy that hadn't had enough room for me, that's why I was in a local cab, got stopped. The first four people dragged out, um, shot, and murdered, including a Spanish woman journalist. Now, Spain was not part of the coalition. It didn't matter. She was other. She was foreign. All that said, we foreign reporters, especially those who work for American TV networks, are infinitely safer than our Iraqi colleagues or colleagues in nearby countries, for that matter. We can afford expensive foreign security teams, which cost upwards of five to $6,000 a day. We can afford the armored vehicles, which cost minimum $100,000 a piece. Our Iraqi colleagues who work for us have to rely instead on their wit, their prayers, and their lies, hoping against hope that when they go out on a story for us, none of their neighbors are going to spot them with a camera or asking questions. Now, um, as my colleague mentioned beforehand, it is inordinately um, uh, the higher number of Iraqis paying the price. Uh, it's, at last count, 13 Europeans killed, more than 100 Iraqi journalists since 2003. Now, some did not hide, and most of those have already paid the ultimate price. Take female TV correspondent Atwar Bajat, who was working for Al Arabiya Television. Now, that's a 24-hour news channel, which is 
usually slammed by journalists over here as being anti-American and therefore anti-democratic. Now the insurgents saw something else. They saw a station and a reporter who believed in free speech. Bajat was a religious veil-wearing Sunni Muslim and she'd gone to Samara to report on the terrorist bombing of the Golden Mosque there, something she saw as a dangerous act bent on destroying this unified Iraq that she wanted to be part of. Her piety did not protect her. She was a symbol for reconciliation, so she was gunned down together with her news crew by fighting to tear that place, um, by those fighting to tear that place apart. Whoever they are opening fire on us, it's as if they think by murdering any of us, they murder our ideas and they manage to silence us. Now, obviously they don't. And that's a crude and bloody way of going about it. But that's one we can all agree in this room it's wrong and we can unite against. And we can, you know, stand on our soapbox and say journalists should be safer and why are they making it so hard for someone like me to get out there and get the story. But that brings me to the second way that I was under attack in Iraq and so were my colleagues under siege. For failing as patriots by criticizing any aspect of the war. It started long before I reached network TV. In the first few years after 9-11, America was infected by this scary virus I like to call, you're with us or you're against us. The only upside I saw after 9-11 was that people who never owned an American flag in their lives discovered patriotism. Some of them for only a time, but there was a real sense of community. But many also discovered fear, hatred, and paranoia directed against anyone who looked like the attackers, i.e. Arab or Muslim, and against anyone who did not fall in with this new flag-waving vogue. Now this was a really bizarre experience for me as I tried to stand there and report from Iraq, and I'd spend the day with U.S. troops and then read something on a conservative website um, that called me a terrorist cheerleader. My mom is a uh, former Rosie the Riveter. My dad is a U.S. Marine who survived the campaigns of Guam and Iwo Jima and turned down his Purple Heart because he didn't think he was wounded badly enough and he lost 70 guys out of his 72-man platoon. Now they brought up six kids on their, er their era's you know, quiet attitudes towards patriotism. Dad raised a flag every day on the back porch, not the front porch. Growing up, I didn't see that kind of attitude reflected very often among my classmates. So post 9-11 in my brief visits to the States, I found some of this in-your-face, flag-waving, flag-wearing patriotism a bit surreal. Journalists reflect the society they live in, so does our reporting. That's the simplest explanation I can come up with why journalists did not dare ask enough tough questions in the run-up to the war with Iraq. Those who did were relentlessly attacked by an administration that was still riding high on what seemed like then to be a relatively easy victory in Afghanistan, and by people who staunchly believed you're with us or you're against us. Maybe if we'd asked tougher questions then, we could have delayed the conflict until we could have gotten a pan-Arab uh, coalition to join us, given the U.S. diplomatic cover for that invasion that would have left us not with the moniker invaders, but allies. Or maybe we could have given someone like General Shinseki the ammunition he needed to get enough boots on the ground to provide security early on so we wouldn't be dealing with the, the bloodlust, the revenge, and the pain and grief that we're dealing with now after five years of killing. But the check and balance of the Fourth Estate was, if not silenced, at least muffled. I didn't work for the CBS network during the run-up to the war, so I can't speak for their decision-making process. I worked for an affiliate that uh, in large part granted me the freedom to report, um, especially since I was stuck in Amman um, for three weeks. I reported all sorts of anti-American sentiment, um, and it got seen by, you know, New York. So. Um, 
But I had a friend who was working at a 24-hour news channel, um, Arab American, and he wanted to report on the potential fallout across the Arab world of hatred that he thought would be inspired by a US-led invasion, and how he thought that that would fuel the ranks of Al Qaeda. Now, this was an opinion I completely shared, what with what I was hearing in all the coffee shops in Jordan, and after my study of Middle East politics and history at UVA, and after years living in the region. My friend's story was dismissed out of hand, and within a year, so was he. Yet last fall's national intelligence estimate on Al Qaeda's popularity, its strength, and its spread, I believe proved them largely correct. On the Arab street and in Iran, they think we're bullies at best, or a bull that has crashed into the Middle East China shop and has no idea how to pick up the pieces. Now, once I moved into Iraq to cover the story for the CBS Evening News, I found well-intentioned people on all sides, risking their lives to make good, but often in the beginning making serious mistakes that stemmed from ignorance of the country or a lack of certainty about our, our mandate, confusion over our goal. I went to countless schools and hospitals refurbished by USAID or more often rebuilt by coalition forces who were struggling to learn their new role as nation builders. I went on raids where U.S. forces thought they were catching the bad guys, even as they would throw the head of the household down on the ground in front of his entire family, put their boots on him, and flexi-cuff him, thereby humiliating him in front of everyone, causing him to lose face, and guaranteeing that even if this guy wasn't guilty in the first place, boy, the moment he's freed, he's going to help with every roadside bomb from here on out. I reported it all the good and the bad, and often feeling like, uh, as I've said a couple times today, the blindfolded guys trying to figure out the shape of the elephant from the tail or the ears. Meanwhile, the rising danger meant that my chances to gather the information were increasingly limited. Yet I kept taking chances trying to report. Three years later, as I lay in a hospital bed recovering from the car bomb, Bloggers were rating me as a journalist, a sampling. One blogger said, I'd championed the U.S. invasion at the expense of the Iraqi people, and I quote, the misinformation and disinformation of which she and others have relentlessly foisted upon us is significantly responsible for enabling and prolonging the disastrous and criminal U.S. invasion of Iraq. However, another website called my reporting bogus because of my alleged negativism toward the war and those prosecuting it. They quoted one of my scripts from 2003 as proof. I wrote of a growing sense of frustration among top brass here that no measure is enough to protect their soldiers or Iraq's resources. Ordinary Iraqis blame Americans for not fixing the damage fast enough, even as the soldiers are risking their lives to do it. America has made new enemies. They're chanting the name of that old foe, Saddam Hussein, and bowing to attack Americans everywhere. I would argue that's exactly what they went on to do, necessitating numerous surges between then and now. I also believe that that report could largely stand, at least until last fall. We see glimmers of it coming back again and again uh, with every surge or resurgence of violence. Now, thanks to the current success of the U.S. military outreach in Anbar, um, the name of Saddam has been replaced. The name of Zarqawi has been uh, replaced. Many of Saddam's former supporters are at present working with the coalition, though one of my friends who helped broker that agreement said, you know, it's the souk right now. We've given them the best deal. You know, wait a week, wait a month. Let's see if we can still match the offers on the table from al-Qaeda and the other places vowing for Sunni support. And as the war has gone on, the public's patience has worn out, and I believe that some people have, have become more willing to hear reports like that. And as I said in the beginning, I, I, was, I was praised in retrospect. But I was also criticized by those who said my reporting didn't go far enough, that I, as a reporter, should have early on declared the war lost. So that brings me to another unpopular message. Now I'm at it again. I've got some 
some headlines on my mind which I want to start bringing to the public's attention, but which will surely get me um, only more criticism from all sides. The first is that we have to do more to win over public opinion in the Arab and wider Muslim world. And we have to consider our actions as a nation in the context of how they're perceived over there, no matter how we originally meant them. I did one story about Iraqi conspiracy theories. Now, the granddaddy of them, widely held by even educated Iraqis, and I'm talking about people with doctorates, they'd sit here and calmly explain to you in a coffee shop, oh yeah, you know why the soldiers throw those candies out to all the kids in the street? Human shields, it's cover to protect them so that no one will bomb them. And you'd look at them going, oh, come on, God, no. You know, they did, little church groups, send them this candy. They've got too much candy. They think, oh, I see kids in the street. Kids are always running up to us, asking us for stuff. So we throw them candy. Try to tell that to Iraqis, and they'll, no, 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 we know what's going on. I uh, did a story about that, and we, we got quite a bit of aggro for it. The other wide, widely held conspiracy theory is that we invaded Iraq to keep oil prices low. And anyone who's gone to fill up the pump see, sees how well that worked out, right? Uh, but that logic does not factor into this equation. The insurgents use it to fuel local anger and to fuel their ranks. So we think we're being scapegoated. They think we're bullies. Perception is 90% of reality. And I'm here to tell you, we have to deal with it. We also have to deal with some wide sweeping generalizations that I've seen developing in this nation. In the gym a couple months back, you all might remember this headline flitted across the screen that um, a baggage handler of Muslim origin was arrested for plotting terrorist attacks. I'm sitting there on my running machine. I hear a woman next to me muttering. Yeah, take out the headphone. Sorry? She said, I can't believe it. What? Well, yeah, it's scary. She said, no, no, no. I can't believe that they let a Muslim do a job like that. And I felt sick. I thought of Atmar Bajat dying for the cause of the Fourth Estate and Iraq and her own form of Muslim democracy. There's one other message that also drives my reporting now. And here's where, you know, again, everyone who tries to put me in a box gets really confused, aggravated, and frustrated. Yes, we've spent a lot of money on the war in Iraq. We haven't done enough for the injured troops. There are many medical mysteries that have been produced by this profusion of blast injuries. There are many things that doctors don't know how to treat. Most of them happen to me. And the American public, they're tuning off to the war in Iraq, and except for the Walter Reed story, they're also tuning off to the fact that there is this um, army of wounded people trying to figure out how to pick up their lives and of doctors trying to figure out how to treat. Um, when your bone gets hit by a blast, they don't know why, but when it heals, it grows spikes. The spikes grow into your muscles. Your muscles can't move. I couldn't run. I should have been able to run, but I couldn't. They x-rayed me. Oh, yeah, you've got heterotopic ossification. What? You have, and then they showed me the picture spikes growing into my muscles. Only way to take that out is six to nine months after the original injury. You take a hammer and a chisel, you put the person under, you have to cut back through everything and chisel it out. So this is what our troops are going through six to nine months after the original in injury when we all think, hey, they're home free. And these injuries, as they're happening to U.S. troops, think how many more Iraqis they're happening to. And they're Afghanis, and now that roadside bombs are so popular and easy to make, you can sign on to several websites and figure out how. Um, if we spend research in the military field, it will drive the civilian world. So yes, I'm both asking the American people to um, spend more on the war effort in the form of aid for the troops. And I'm asking them to send a message of peace and conciliation to the Middle East directed at those Muslims who, frankly, hate us for what we think is no good reason. You might say I've learned almost nothing uh, from being bombed. I'm still pursuing my own agenda, which is 
sure to baffle, confound, and stir criticism from both sides of the political spectrum and from my own colleagues. And my agenda is calling, calling it like I see it, no matter what the cost and no matter um, who shouts loudly in the aftermath. Or you could say that surviving the bombing um, has reinforced the courage of my convictions. I realize that because my job is to hold up a mirror to show us our failings as well as our triumph, that my message will never be popular. But if I let the critics be my internal compass and keep quiet, as we did too often, I think, at the beginning of this conflict, sometimes in the middle, and hopefully not so much now, if I do that, I'm failing the American people, and I'm also failing that voice in my head and my heart which tells me to do what's right. Thank you very much. And, and now I guess it's time for y'all to turn the tables on the journalist. Help me with questions. Just pretend it's Fox. I can take it. Can we give us some hope that there are people in the State Department, at least, who understand enough of the subtleties and enough of the cultural uh, nuances that five years from now, at least, there'd be a different picture. Well, I think five years in, what, what even two years in, what was surprising me is how fast the U.S. military was learning and the hard way. They make a mistake, they lose people. Um, and they had to learn because, as we've all heard, uh, the State Department couldn't fill the ranks. They, and even when they did fill the ranks, the state rotations are six months. Iraq is a society where people need to get to know your face, your family. They need to trust you first before they're going to um, extend the cooperation to you, which risks their lives, especially if they're going against local tribal interests, et cetera, et cetera. And so you'd have, you know, they'd get to know a state person, and then the guy would be gone, and the next face would come in. And that was one of the hardest things for both the Iraqis and the U.S. military, that um, there was no continuity. They were always just trying to figure out who the next person was who was supposed to be doing the job. So you had a lot of U.S. military guys with their SERP funds, that these are the private funds that they would have um, to do with what they thought was necessary, and they would say, okay, this neighborhood needs electricity. Anyone know how to wire anything? Oh, you were an electrician once? Okay. And so they did a lot of things with a lot of good intention, but sometimes they weren't community planners. They didn't know how to um, do follow through. They'd build a great water treatment plant, but then they would just assume that the Iraqis would have a plan in place to keep maintenancing it. And the next unit would come back a year later to check on this thing that was built a year ago, and it would be lying in disrepair. Well, the generator ran out of gas, and you Americans never gave us any more gas. So I think the understanding is there now. But is there not just the political will among the American people, but is there enough political capital left among the Iraqi people to keep working with us? Um, or do we have a lot of different coalitions saying, okay, we're going we're gonna to ride this um, show pony until the fair shuts down, take them for all we can get, um, that is what U.S. troops, U.S. commanders are facing right now. Um, they don't know if they have the people left who can be good partners. And, but they keep got to trusting the people who are available. A lot of the people that we worked with early on who showed you know, promise have either, um, according to both the diplomats and the commanders I've spoken to, oh, heck, our whole translating team for CBS News has left. Um, most of them are Sunni, and they're, they're terrified. They're in Syria and Amman. Um, same thing is happening. If you, can, if you can get out, if you got the money or the influence, many Iraqis have taken that path, that many educated people. And that's the scariest thing, because then you've got left um, the people who can't get out but desperately want to, or the people who have their hands um, on the tribal or the mafia-style power that drives much of that country. And that's a rough crowd to deal with. I promise not all my answers will be that long.
Hi. Those who criticize you and other journalists for embedding with U.S. troops, what is their realistic alternative for journalists to get in there and get the story without the cooperation, the logistical support, and the physical protection of the U.S. forces? Well, I have some colleagues that um, won't embed, and they, they'll go, they'll follow an Iraqi politician. They'll follow a USAID contractor. Um, there, there are other ways to cover the story, um, very legitimate ways. They'll go interview an Iraqi artist, um, spend time at a mosque. I was comfortable, am comfortable with the U.S. military, which is something that got me grief. Um, you have to be careful when you embed in that you can get too close to your subjects. And just like being a reporter in D.C., well, we all, you know, heard the tale of um, Judith Miller getting too close to her sources, not asking tough enough questions, and then reporting WMD as sort of fact uh, without what the New York Times later felt was um, enough stringent questioning of her sources. So the same thing can happen with the U.S. military. You've got to understand that even when you're with them and you understand what they're going through and you understand the stresses they're under, when a Haditha happens, you still report that Haditha happened. So that's, that's the hard part because, you know, you can, if you spend too much time with any particular group, you can go native. And that's just one of the hazards of the job. And if you do that, you're not doing your job. So. I've scared you all into silence. Uh, I have a question. Why, what do you account for the relatively few number of journalists who are actually resident in Iraq? Uh, I believe in my year that I was there, we had the New York Times, the Washington Post, and often on the Christian Science Monitor. But beyond that, there wasn't any media actually living in the country for extended periods of time, as, say, Mr. Burns was well, for the New York Times. Well, actually, all the networks were. We always, we couldn't leave it uncovered. I mean, since 2003, we've had a continuous presence there. So is ABC, so is NBC, so is CNN, so is Fox. We all share the same security people, so I know their rotations. Uh, I mean, you're talking, what, how many reporters? 50 total in that number? Um, if you mean correspondence? Correspondence, sure. Uh, the correspondence would be on a, usually a four-week rotation. So you mean as opposed to living there for a full year? Yeah, I mean, I, I, guess, what I'm, I guess what I'm trying to get at is that Vietnam, you had literally hundreds of reporters reporting that story. Oh, in Iraq, well, that's, that's easy. That's easy. Once the kidnappings and the bombings started, expenses. Uh, the security teams were expensive. Look what happened to Jill Carroll. Jill Carroll was operating in Baghdad the same way I operated in Pakistan, Egypt, Libya. Uh, I had a local translator. I paid 50 bucks a day, and I hired a cab when I needed one. You can't do that in Iraq. You get marked. The place she visited, they saw she wasn't traveling with security. The next day when she came back or when they lured her back, they knew that she would be an easy target. So many of the freelancers, there are freelancers who come and basically live with the U.S. military. They either live in the field in Iraq or in Afghanistan, because some of the press officers tell me about them. Like, oh, yeah, we've got this one guy. He's lived with us for six months. We think he's actually just here for free food, because he's not filing very much. And... Um, I think it's the, it, it's the danger factor. And also, one thing I didn't get into um, so much in this particular address, but man, this story, the risk is going up like this and the reward down like this. Uh, as I was telling uh, some people earlier today, see some faces in the crowd, we used to measure ratings by the hour, or by the half hour. Now we measure it by the minute. And you put a story on Iraq up in your broadcast and you can measure people changing the channel. So my bosses were saying, oh, great, going to give me another hospital opening, another school, another electricity plant, another bombing. You know, do you have anything new? And then, so I'd get creative. I did Iraq as a Prozac nation. Now I've seen everybody else do that one. We all did the Iraqi children scarred for life by war. Uh, there became these themes that you know, I could see other journalists in this desperate hunt 
for the uncovered story that didn't give first our bosses and then the audience back home image fatigue. And in the meantime, the cost of covering this war was rising. Um, the million dollars a month figure for um, our network came from having to have four full-time security guys and then uh, foreign security guys, and that sometimes bumped up to six. And then you had a, a staff of 30 Iraqis, and boy, you had to teach them weapon safety because, you know, we had a couple of negligent discharges on our hallway. Uh, this is when guys do not, um, not to uh, clued in as to where the trigger is and when there's actually a round in the chamber and they fire it in a concrete hallway and it ricochets around. So um, it's, it costs a lot of money and then not too many people are picking up the stories anymore. So that's, that's why I think you had a whole bunch the first year, but it's not in vogue anymore. Um, I have a question which is actually um, just, it's a, it may not sound like a friendly question, but it really is a friendly question. It's just an honest question. Okay. Uh, and I'd just like to know what your view is of, and if you, maybe you can explain since, you know, it's not, uh, most of us are not in the business of journalism, of television journalism uh, in particular, of what is the relationship between the ratings and what goes on on, on what the news is? So I guess here's what I'm asking really to explain a little better. There seems to be an enormous amount of apathy about the Iraq war in this country, okay? People don't want to hear about it. People don't want to care about it. People don't want to think about it in general, and uh, which is very disappointing, I think, to a lot of us who are concerned about the loss of life. Um, and I'm wondering, what's the relationship between that and the fact that it's not reported? If it were reported more, do you think that maybe perhaps there would be more interest in the Iraq war? Or is it the fact that people are not interested and it's all about who owns the networks these, these days, the people that actually own these networks that are making decisions about which stories go on television, and it's all about ratings and... I... I yeah. No, no, it's not. Yes, the American public wants to hear, you know, it's one or it's done, and it's not. Uh, they want black and white, don't we all? Um, Iraq has the kind of history that guarantees a messy, bloody, unfinished ending full of shades of gray. And that is, that's hard to tell in a minute 30, first of all. And second of all, my bosses are viewers too, and I do have to bring them something new. I do have to tell the story in a different way. So there is, there's a battle not just between, okay, they've seen it all before, so they have image fatigue, and that's not fair, because it's not you know, my fault or the troops' fault that it's the same story over and over, but it's also my job to find a way to break through that. You get spikes of news that will bring it back on um, bring, bring it back into people's minds, if not their hearts. The way that you have to, the only way to get people interested sometimes is to find an ind individual with a compelling story. I think one of the, look, when I was hit, I'm a workaday journalist. I am not um, an anchor like Bob Woodruff. I was, I didn't have a big, what we call, you know, Q rating wasn't widely recognized across America. But all of a sudden, you had a fresh, new, and unique reminder of what had been happening there every day. And I think that's partly why our particular incident got such wide coverage. No network had lost that many people in one day. So my camera crew was killed. Captain Funkhauser was killed. His translator was killed. For most of the day, I was you know, just on the edge. And people seem to forget that, you know, half the reporters over there are women, so that was unique. So that was one of those bizarre situations where, hey, if that had been four people, any four U.S. troops killed by a car bomb, it probably wouldn't have even made, you know, a tell in the broadcast. But it was some new, horrible, and unique um, way of telling the story that brought it home to people. I got thousands of letters and emails and cards, and flowers, and, you know, I wasn't deserving of all that, but it wasn't about me. It was about the fact that 
what happened on that day drove it home to people in a new way that reminded them, oh my God, it's still happening and happening and happening. So, you know, partly it's our responsibility to find the individual that drives the story home. In this case, I wrote a book. Maybe a bunch of people will read it. I have come to peace with the fact that if I have to use my story and my personality to remind people, yeah, this is what's happening to, what is 1% of the country that's bearing the cost of this war, remember them, and remember the next time you vote or choose not to vote or choose not to listen to a news broadcast or choose not to be informed that there is a government acting on your behalf and there are people uh, fighting and dying on your behalf, you just really should pay attention and maybe even consider taking responsibility for that. And I'm hoping that this election, with so many people, um, seemingly especially younger people, energized by it, that it will start to shift, that people will start to care about what happens over there as much as they care about, you know, Brittany over here. So, sir. Um, we have one over can, here. We, we, have a, we have a microphone coming your way unless you had a, a background in acting and you can project. Just a second. I think they're filming. Cheers. Uh, do you have a feel for the attitude of some of these countries that surround our, Iraq? Uh, I, I say they, there's a big dog fight going on and they don't have necessarily have a, a dog in it, but they're oh, sure as heck are, ought to be interested in what happens. The Turks, uh, the Iranians, the Oh, they, they all have dogs in it. Yeah, don't, don't you fool yourself. They're all well, involved. Yeah, but I mean, I, I would think that our administration would be putting a little bit of back channel effort to them say, hey, we can pull out and leave everything in a mess. Now, what are you going to do if we do? You know, for instance, the Kurds would love their independence, but the Turks have a, Kurds, the Iranians have Kurds, the Syrians do. Uh, and then if the two religious groups go at it, Saudi Arabia is a little different. I mean, I think we have a little bit of leverage or arm twisting. And uh, do you have any sense or feel that uh, have we started to or are we quietly trying to exploit that? I can only um, hope that we have. I know that there have been all the right diplomatic tours made by high level members of the current administration. I know that some of my friends at the State Department feel energized like they're getting listened to again. But, you know, things move slowly on the ground in the Middle East, and you've got such a complicated situation with so many different actors. Um, are you saying, have they teed everything up so we can quickly hand off this hot potato and get the heck out of there? Not, no, 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 that's not, that's not set up yet. Um, would that be nice? Wow. Uh, that. Uh, would probably be the current administration's um, dream ticket. But why would anybody else take on this mess? So, uh, you know, a little out of my bailiwick. Sure, I'd love to see that happen. I don't see signs of that yet, working on the ground. Fate's in our hands. They didn't invade. But they, who's they? Oh, I thought you were talking, I thought you were talking about the countries, are you talking about the countries around Iraq or, or the, You know, we've all heard about different um, efforts going on that the administration is talking to the Saudis who are working with the Wahhabis. You could say that's part of what's happened with the awakening. But you could just say part of what's happening with the awakening is that, you know, that, that, been, that had been underway for a couple years. Um, that is the guys on the ground deciding who is going to give them the best deal. 
And that's, that's how this is going to be decided. That's, yeah, well, well, it, and, that, and that's something that Americans, um, you know, should pay attention and, and, and help make that decision. Well, Yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not taking issue with you. It's just as a journalist, I can report to you as much as I know that, that's been going on, but I'm hearing that third and fifth hand over in D.C. I haven't been on the ground and talked to a Jordanian official and said, okay, what's the latest U.S. diplomat to cozy up to you and what did he ask you to do? That's what I'd need to do to be able to properly answer your questions. Um, you spend a lot of time in the Middle East. You have a lot of experience in the region. Do you have any advice for someone who's like interested in traveling or studying in the Middle East um, on Learn how Arabic, to I wish I had how to counter kind of the tide of rising anti-Americanism that you've seen across the region uh, I did hear a great report on NPR the other day about some Americans studying in Syria who said that they were surprised that they didn't find a lot of anti-Americanism there usually on an individual basis it's not um, you know, you, you can get a crowd shouting down with America, but if you walk up to someone and say, you know, but they, hi, you know, can I buy a newspaper, and they pick up your accent, they're actually usually more curious about engaging you and talking to you. So, um, you know, you find a good institution or structure or some sort of support um, before you go over there to cut all of the lovely red tape in a lot of those post-Soviet um, bureaucratic systems. And um, then just go with an open mind, and if you're a woman, wear long sleeves and long skirts. I always found that was the easiest way to get respect. So, any other, sir? Oh, sorry, ma'am. Uh, you mentioned earlier, briefly, when you were describing a Captain Von oh, Kaiser. Sorry, by the way, anybody with um, homework, I won't be offended if you need to go. So. You made reference to confusion or a disconnect about the mandate. Can you speak more about what the troops on the ground were? I, I didn't quite hear the beginning of your question. <laughs> when you were describing the actual event and Captain Funkhauser, and you made reference to the mandate and, and the fact that the mandate is, has been changing uh, officially or unofficially as we go along. Can you talk some more about that, what your experience or what you learned from being embedded with the troops, speaking one-on-one -on -one with, with individuals? Now, i gotta, I got to say, I've spent a lot more time with the troops and gotten to know them a lot more since the bombing than I ever did in Iraq. Because well, we always only ever got snapshots. Very seldom could I spend extended time, because as a network journalist, since it cost so much money to have just one correspondent in town, I couldn't stay out overnight. I had to stay near the satellite dish to be able to file in case Zarqawi got caught. First it was in case Saddam got caught, and that always tied me to the bureau. And then it was if Zarqawi got caught. So what it meant was I was not allowed to go with in more than 45 minutes away from the bureau. And I had to always be back by 3 p.m. in the afternoon, which was 7 a.m. Eastern time, to do the early show live shot. So I was getting small snippets of, you know, I'd spend a morning with a bunch of guys, and I'd get little impressions. Um, but it wasn't until the second and the third year when some of the guys started coming back. After they'd gone back to the state, seen my reporting, and then come back, and it takes a long time to win some of these people over because, you know, they think we're scum. And in some cases, they're probably right. And then I started hearing things like, oh, God, if we'd only known in the first year what we know now, do you know the mistakes we made? And they would list them. And they would list all the things that, wow, I could have told them um, the first year, but now they only knew as much as I did, plus more. And so that was heartening. But they also saw their mission change from, you know, Bremer bring, bring democracy, and then it was um, get it just good enough to hand over to the Iraqis, and then it's like, uh, uh, but, but, but the security is up to them, that's their problem. And then it was like, oh, we better protect the Iraqis because we didn't protect them for a while, and now so many people have killed each other that everyone hates each other, and we've got a near civil war on our hands. So their mission changed partly because of mistakes and partly because 
situation on the ground evolved in organic ways that maybe we should have seen coming, but um, that's uh, something for historians to write about later. Every, every, every so many uh, uh, television broadcasts on the public television, they'll um, show a, a list of the casualties of, of soldiers who have been killed with their hometowns and pictures so that Americans can appreciate the sacrifices. Has there been any more uh, effort from the press, or particularly the television media, to show uh, flag draped coffins coming home back to Andrews Air Force Base to give the American public, until the public understands, because, you know, there's three men here, are three women killed here, there's four casualties there, there's five people killed here. People are kind of numb to that. They, I think that the public really needs to appreciate what the sacrifices are, is to actually see in more detail what, what the sacrifices are really like in, in the television well, medium. You know that um, the Bush administration won't let us in to film the coffins. Um, for a while, uh, CBS was doing something called, um, was it? American Heroes, it was a little segment where we profile somebody for 15 seconds, two or three times a week, um, you know, someone who had just died. And I know that McNeil Lehrer does it every night. Um, the New York Times and some of the other places, you'll, you'll, the latest casualties. I'm on the DOD casualty count register, so I get an email every time there's a confirmed casualty. And it, um, it doesn't seem to me that uh, I, you don't see that gathered together in too many places. The sad thing was, early on, if you did gather it together, you were criticized for being anti the war effort. And um, now, I don't know, did it become a convenient thing just to stop reporting? Did it fall off the map just because it was part of Iraq image fatigue? Uh, some places still do it once in a while, or we'll wait till you know we hit 4,000, or we hit um, an anniversary, and then we remind everybody. But yeah, you're right. It's just becoming a blur, you know, a blur mostly of small town kids who, um, you know, went over there to try to make good. We have time for one more question. Converging microphones. Kim, uh, tonight and today you've talked about um, the difficulties of 12 second or 90 seconds to cover a complex, nuanced story, the difficulty of keeping important news in front of the American people. And you've personally paid a great price for trying to do that over the years. What drives you to keep doing it when, when there's so many, when so many others just want to cover Brittany because there's so much more money or attention to be to that? Why do you, what, what keeps you going? Um, first of all, I, I find Brittany incredibly boring. <laughs> um, the, re the reason I got into this job was I originally wanted to be a human rights activist. And I saw that the other human rights activists who worked for the UN, this, that, and the other, they would risk their lives, go all over the world, gather this incredible information together. I used to translate Latin American torture testimonials. It's a very depressing job. And then they'd take this wealth of knowledge and they'd go to the New York Times or ABC or Time Magazine and beg for just a couple column inches. And I looked at that and I said, well, wait a minute. Where in this equation do I want to be? I want to be saying yes to the story. I want to speak for those who can't. Whether it's you know, a 22-year-old kid from Iowa who's put his whole life and soul into being a good captain and then gets blown away and his benefits screwed up and you know, his wife has uh, an eight dollar a month check to survive on, um, or you know it's an Iraqi orphan without a family because the family got blown away at a U.S. checkpoint. Oh, by that 22 year old kid the day before, who thought he was protecting his guys, and oh hey, guess what? He was. So the day before he shot the wrong um, Iraqi family. The next day he hesitated and he got 
blown up by a car bomb. You know, I want to represent that whole picture. And if I'm, um, it's complicated, it's messy, and that's, that's okay. That's my job. I've got to find a way to make you all listen or we're going to keep blundering into massive mistakes that make people hate us and ultimately pull my country down and make it a place that I'm, this is a place I want to be proud of. And if I don't stand up and say what needs to be changed, then um, you know, I'm not doing my job. And that's part of the job that I try to do every day I go out there and report. So thank you very much. Clark Forum, Dickinson College, I would like to present Ms. Dozier with a token of our appreciation for her wonderful lecture. It is a miniature version of the poster that was used to advertise oh, this event. Thank you um, very much. Please um, give a warm hand to Ms. Dozier. Thank you. Thank you. Um, whoever did this did a really great job. Um, also, Ms. Dozier will be signing booklets um, that are in the hallway. Um, they're sh a short, I guess, snippet of her upcoming book. So if you're interested in getting her signature and, you know, getting a glimpse of her new publication, please, uh, they're in the hallway and they're free. Yeah. Thank you. So. Have a good evening. This concludes our lecture tonight. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.